just another minute. I think we, you know, we have Alderman here and um, at least one of my colleagues who will also be presenting. So let's um, let's give it just another minute. To get a few more folks in, um, and we'll go from there. All right, everybody, I'll get started. Um, welcome. Uh, thanks for the uh, introductions. There's some, appears to be some liveliness to the group today, which I appreciate. It's not always the case with some of these other groups um, when you're doing online and on a Monday morning. Uh, it's, it's not always the easiest time, but here we all are, and I thank you all for coming. Um, so uh, just a quick agenda. Uh, we'll do uh, some quick department updates. I'd like to introduce a new staff. Oops. So a new staff member uh, when I get a chance, but um, I'm not sure he's on yet, but when he comes on, I'll be sure to uh, have him say hello. Uh, he's new to the West region and um, will be helping us out. Uh, we'll give an update on the quarter manager um, and then we'll do an NOF update. And then I'll have another one of my colleagues, Ethan Lasseter, discuss the RFP process. Um, the RFPs for three communities uh, just wrapped up and are, are live, I suppose now. And, you know, we need to start thinking ahead to what comes next uh, for our corridor and, and how we want to manage uh, a future RFP. Then we'll kind of review some opportunity sites and then talk about, you know, economic development in the board, what we want to see and do. So uh, without further ado, um, yeah, again, shout out to all our community partners who are on the line today. I appreciate you guys joining. Um, and if there's anything you want to say or um, feel free to speak up uh, at any time. And thank you as well to Alderman Maldonado for joining. I appreciate that. Uh, so a quick update. Um, we, we did select the corridor manager. It's the Puerto Rican Community Cultural Center. Um, and, and Nadia, we talk, talked a little bit ago, and uh, you'll be running that. So um, uh, congratulations. Um, and uh, anything you want to say, feel free. Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to unmute myself. Yeah. yeah, so we are really excited about uh, having the opportunity to work with you guys and Invest Southwest Initiative. And, uh, you know, we're ready to, to start the process and, uh, you know, take it from there. And we thank you for the opportunity, of course. And again, in conjunction with, uh, with Caroline, who's on the line, we'll, our department will work to kind of develop a program of what that might look like going forward. So. Uh, Nadia, I look forward to working with you, and uh, I'm glad you guys were the uh, folks that were selected. Now we were we were. Um, is this around? No. Um, so we are the. Um, we were assigned for the North Avenue, only. Correct. Yes, um, Chicago Avenue. I think you applied as well. But that we well, yes, to. yeah, went to the West Humboldt Park Development Council. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, hear a voice? Okay, guess not. Um, okay, so uh, let's jump over to NOF. Uh, Sophia Carey from our NOF division is here and wants to give a quick update um, about what's going on with NOF. So, yeah. Take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me just a few minutes of your time today uh, with the roundtable. Um, just wanted to share a quick update in terms of how the NOF um, application submission is coming along. Um, as a uh, just uh, as a reminder, our application opened on September 14th, so exactly two weeks ago. Um, and I just wanted to uh, share some of the numbers for now so that you guys are 
um, kind of aware of the activity or the um, popularity of the program in, in, um, in your area. So um, these numbers are actually just for the first week. Um, in the first week, the seven question project readiness quiz was completed just over 1,500 times. Um, 1,488 times. Um, there were duplicates, meaning um, one email address might have gone through the quiz and then decided to go back and, and redo it. Um, and so if we just look at the unique email addresses, it was 1,183. So it's still very high, especially for the first week. Um, it is um, actually higher, our first week is higher than all of the previous round earlier this year. So we are looking at having a um, pretty active and competitive application round um, this, uh, this time around. Um, as of um, the first week, we, re we received 101 applications. Uh, so this is the full application um, that applicants are able to complete once they've passed the readiness quiz. And of the 101, one was uh, specifically in the Humboldt Park community area. So, um, uh, you know, that number obviously we'd like to see increase. Um, if you look, this is where the applications are located across the city. Um, we have not done any review except to geocode the addresses. So as you can see, the West region is kind of running second place, if you will, in terms of overall quantity. Um, but most of that is in the Austin community area. So um, just wanted to share, Humble Park is at one, even though the West region is so high. Um, just as a reminder, applications are, um, we're accepting applications all the way up until November 6th. So we would say, uh, please, if you know of any good projects or potential applicants in your region, please have them apply so that we have a strong um, selection pool to uh, review from um, and uh, make sure that some of that funding uh, that is uh, available for this round will go to Humble Park. Can I ask a question? This yes. is Roberto Maldonado. Yes. So um, who is eligible to apply? Business owners or commercial property landowners or property owners. And when you said that only one application came in from Humble Park. Right. Um, do you mean Humble Park as it is defined in the city neighborhoods map? Yes. In the community area, right. Yeah. And so do you know where that applicant is from? Because, um, I mean, um, it's the area is huge. I have part of Humble Park. Uh -huh. But I know most of Humble Park, West Humble Park, it's really in the 27th and um, the 27th and 20, 27th Ward and 28th, I think. Yeah, I, um, you know, I unfortunately don't have the specifics because what we do is it's a big data file that we send over to GIS and, and they are basically just mapping it to the city's community area maps. So when I look at it, I, I don't know if there's another area that, um, a community area name that uh, you're more interested in, but of the 29 that's in the West region, 20 of them are in the Austin community area. And then everyone else is, you know, one or two. So, and the other community areas that popped up were East Garfield Park, um, Humboldt Park, West, Lower West Side, North Lawndale, South Lawndale, and West Garfield Park. Hmm. So, Austin got 20, all of the other community areas got nine. So, the it, area it, that we are discussing today, uh, at least, you know, the North Avenue uh, corridor, obviously, is not part of Humboldt Park. Oh. Okay, my then then that's my I, ignorance. I, I apologize. I think I had uh, just looked at the zoning map for this corridor, and I thought it popped up as Humboldt Park, but maybe um, maybe I'm wrong in that, and I, I looked at the wrong. Um, I was looking at the wrong area. Is there another community area that is a better fit for um, this corridor? Mike, do you know? It, it, I mean, I think it, its official destination would be West Humboldt Park um, among the 77 community areas of Chicago. That's my understanding. It's Humboldt, it's Humboldt Park. Yeah. It's Humboldt Park. How do you define Humboldt Park North Avenue between 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 Ketsy and Cotton? 
Yeah, I think the West Humboldt Park community area is part of like Chicago's community designations is everything. But, but uh, who, who's talking? Oh, sorry, Mike Perella. Mike? Yeah. My, I, to my understanding, um, Humboldt Park is basically south of Division and west of Ketsi. Um, I might be mistaken, but th that's my understanding. My understanding is it runs all the way up to the, the, the what would be the 606 right of way. Well, um, that's not true. Um, you may want to double check on that. And, and I, I hope that I'm wrong, but I, I don't think so. Well, I'm happy to uh, do that research um, and I'll share that with Mike just because we do want to make sure that when we're speaking about community areas that we're all looking in the kind of the right boundaries. So I'll, I'm happy to do that and send it to Mike um, later today. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything else uh, regarding NOF? So I mean, the, the, the goal here is to get as many applications right as we can from the community. That's because the more applications, the more chances of success. Well, but I'm also looking out for the community that I represent. Otherwise, you know, that's, why, that's why I'm asking the questions. It's nice that a bunch of people are, uh, might be applying. I want to see the response in the area, in the community that I do represent. Yeah. Um, so this is just for the first week, Alderman. Um, our uh, total um, application range is from now, you know, is, is a total of eight weeks, I think. So of the eight, two have passed. Um, we've still got six weeks to go. So I would say, um, Alderman, you know, definitely let, let your constituents know that it's available and that they should apply. Um, we do um, hope to come back at the end of uh, towards the end of October, so basically the next roundtable meeting, and give another update on the total numbers. So be, you know, so within this next month, this is really time for everyone to, um, you know, let uh, those that they know in the area that are working on um, development, commercial development, let them know that the application is open and that if they're interested, they should apply. So, so the corridor manager has the ability to promote this application process as well? Yes. Uh, excuse me? Yes, they, yes, that should be um, a responsibility. So, oh, so Naya, you're gonna be taking, you're gonna be pushing for this, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike and Sophia, is it possible to send the Puerto Rican, because Nadia has context, the Puerto Rican agenda also has a very large listserv that includes um, business owners and commercial building landlords. Is it possible to send those promotional materials that uh, articulate who's eligible and what it funds? Because when I looked at the website, it's very specific, right? It funds storefront build out, plumbing, HVAC all that good stuff. It would just be good if we had like a nice one pager to be able to put out. Uh, sure, I can definitely send um, a one pager over to you. I just put my email address on the chat. So if you guys wanna email me, that's fine. Um, if you, Mike, if you go back to that first slide, um, there is a lot of information on our website. So there's two ways to get to it. You can go chicago.gov slash NOF, or you can type in neighborhoodopportunityfund.com, which is longer. It goes to the same site. Um, but if you go there, there's a lot of information, including information for applicant support. Yeah, yeah, no, and I appreciate the site. I, what I wanna be able to do is, is put, out, put forward a promotional ad, if you guys have one, right? Yeah. Something that can go. Sure. Um, if you'll email right, me, email. Jesse, I'll send it to you for sure. Perfect. I will email you now. Thank you, Sophia. Great. Thanks. All right. That's it for me. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Sophia. Thank you. And before I move on, um, uh, Ernest Bellamy, I think, is on the line. He's our new West Region uh, planner. Uh, Ernest, put me on the spot here, but uh, if you mind introducing yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ernest Bellamy, I'm a new city planner for the West Region. Uh, joining the team, I've been here for a little over uh, six weeks now. Uh, oh, been... no, 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 no. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ernest. See so you in the office. All righty. Um, so let's uh, move on to talk about the RFP process. As I meant, alluded to earlier in the uh, presentation, 
um, not the start of the meeting, I should say, you, the RFPs at the end of August were released for three communities, uh, uh, Austin, Auburn, Gresham, and Inglewood. And, and they'll be the model moving forward for how we want to manage the RFP process in this corridor and others. And uh, one of the uh, people um, who was instrumental in developing this uh, kind of model RFP was a colleague of mine in the West Region, Ethan Lasseter. And uh, he'll talk through what that process looks like and what the goals are and what the um, uh, criteria are. And uh, without further ado, I'll let him take it away because he's a real expert on this. Thank you, Mike. Um, Good morning, everyone, uh, or afternoon, isn't it? <laughs> afternoon. Um, as Mike said, um, I think I'll just grab the screen if it's easier to present, if that's all right with you. Um, Feel free. Can you do that? Uh, I can't while well, you are sharing. Okay, so I'll stop sharing and you'll, you'll just put yours up? Yeah, that sounds good. All right, that worked. All right, so um, as Mark has mentioned, um, I wanna get into kind of what is an RFP, what is a request for proposals and how are these Invest Southwest proposals a little bit more uh, nuanced. So again, requests for proposals are really um, a request to solicit development on normally city owned land and or land that we are uh, working with a owner on. Um, traditionally, they kind of provide just basic details about a property and kind of a preferred use on the site. Uh, the Invest Southwest RFPs go a little further and really kind of show uh, the desired use, the kind of desired character, urbanism, and use of a site uh, that we think is more vetted and supported by the community. Um, they're also built to kind of create an understanding of if this is a d desired concept, uh, what is the cost of this project and how much financial incentives are needed to make this feasible at a high level. Um, and again, an RFP is not a plan. Uh, the kind of the concepts, the drawings and narratives are designed to shape the responses that DPD receives from developers um, and the, the images are supposed to be shaped by engagement with the community through roundtables like this, through specific visioning workshops for those projects um, to really determine a kind of potential use, kind of scale of the project and the site layout uh, that we think uh, fits the site collectively. So again, just kind of an update on this progress uh, and this process. Uh, this is kind of the implementation of an element of Invest Southwest. Again, the goal of Invest Southwest being to marshal and kind of coordinate the resources of multiple city departments to reactivate neighborhood cores um, that have historically served as focal points for neighborhoods. And in this case, this RFP process started with three in August, the goal being that these three can be templates for other regions. Uh, these first three shown below in Austin, Inglewood, and Auburn Gresham, with the goal being that every three months thereafter, uh, the city is releasing three more RFPs. So November, and then again in February, and again in May. Um, again, a focus has been on city-owned land. In areas uh, like North Avenue, where we actually don't own a lot of city-owned land, it's more about how do we partner with private entities that are interested and willing participants in that process. Um, but again, focusing on kind of the front doors of neighborhoods where the city can control the development outcome to reflect what the city and community most desire. And then these RFPs were designed to have three kind of larger goals that go above and beyond soliciting development. The first being facilitating design excellence on the south and west sides, um, achieved through the design excellence principles and the neighborhood design guidelines that were recently released. Um, this also comes about through a partnership we have with the Chicago Central Area Committee, which is a kind of just a consortium of all the um, kind of major design and real estate uh, firms in Chicago. 
who have been providing pro bono uh, design and real estate services for these RFPs and for these corridors. Uh, the most recent three that were released were led by Perkins and Will, SOM, and SCB as the main architecture firm. And the goal of these is that we present multiple development possibilities by the community, get feedback, adjust them, um, determine which concepts are kind of the preferred alternative. And with that preferred concept, we get a kind of more detailed rendering or image of what it could look like. Um, and then this, this comes about via a more inclusive decision making process that really helps shape and guide economic development. Again, the goal is not that the city already knows exactly what's going to happen and is coming in in the back end to engage. It's that we up front need to help kind of determine and shape um, where is this going, what sites are preferred, what uh, building and design is preferred. And again, this gets to kind of the idea of funding impl impl uh, implications that we actually know not just that we prefer a certain concept, but we have a sense of how much it will cost, how much money we can raise for a project, um, and then how much money the city needs to put in for those projects. Uh, just basic kind of funding availability has suggested that we can only really do one major large scale mixed use project on each corridor. There is certainly still room for other projects and activities, but um, the scale is certainly something to keep in mind when considering priorities. So, so again, really the goal is that a RFP development manual shows developer what is desired by the community and feasible with coordinated city incentives. Finally, why do this? The RFPs are designed to build local wealth above and beyond what the city has done uh, historically. So we want to do that using RFP submission requirements, ensuring that in black and brown communities, applicants are local developers of color as often and as much as possible. There are four different levels of potential involvement. This is the actual development team, the kind of designers, architects involved in a project, uh, the contractor, the GC and the trades, and then the tenants and businesses actually occupying the space. Um, noting the 26 and 6 Chicago ordinance for contractors and trades is the only area where we actually have existing ordinance designating this, but we can prioritize um, and advance submittance who kind of respond to more of these uh, local wealth building uh, priorities for the area. And again, this is in partnership with uh, other organizations trying to advance similar work uh, to increase professional services and professional services by um, more inclusive and more people of color driven firms. So the, we're working with the Chicago Architecture Center to create a list of preferred local design services firms uh, that was recently released, is in the most recent RFPs and is available on the Invest Southwest website and Chicago Architecture Center website. We're working with a, another org two, two other organization, organizations actually, both LISC and Shy Acre, Chicago African Americans in Commercial Real Estate. We're both working on kind of building a um, pipeline um, and uh, skill, uh, kind of skill build building for kind of emerging developers of color um, to participate in commercial real estate projects. And again, why advance this? The real goal is that we believe local developers, again, hire locally and lease local businesses and understand and are of their community more than outside. And again, we want to use the RFP selection process, not just releasing the RFP, but certainly as that process moves forward, as folks get kind of a short list of respondents, as finalists present to the community, as community feedback is incorporated into the negotiation process, that we get uh, developments and developers that reflect the communities of the priority. And then very briefly, just noting one of the first comments made that three RFPs are intended to be released every three months with the goal being that there's construction occurring on all 12 Invest Southwest corridors by 2022. And again, there is continued, even after an RFP is released in this step one, there's continued rounds of community engagement in the process. An RFP is certainly intended to be a larger step than it has been in the past, but this um, kind of winnowing and priority making does continue well beyond an RFP release um, through a redevelopment agreement with the developer. With that, that's kind of the intention of the RFP. Uh, one is intended to come to Humboldt Park and North Avenue. 
uh, in the future, but wanted to kind of preface this so there's a, a wider understanding. So with that, any questions or concerns? So yes, I have a question, I'm sorry. Um, when are you expected to have these uh, RFPs released? So, um, so they're every three months. The last ones were in August. I don't believe Humboldt Park is due for November. Pretty sure we know that. Um, so, so Humboldt Park. So you released one in Humboldt Park. Is that is that what you're telling me? No, no, no. Wow. They, no, no, they no, haven't no. been released in Humboldt Park yet. Okay, no, we're I'm, in the so pre, pre pre planning stages. Okay, so when are you planning to release the RFPs in Humboldt Park? So you're you're in pre planning. So you have released other RFPs to what community area? So I can write them down. Auburn, Gresham, Inglewood, and Austin. Okay, give me one quick second. That was a little quick. So Humboldt Park is the afterthought? No. Okay, okay so you said Ar Arburn. Hold on, give me one second. Aburn? Auburn, Gresham. Oh. Auburn, Gresham. It's uh -huh. on the page if you, can, if you can see the screen. Inglewood, okay, and Austin. So when is our, just so that we are all prepared, when, when is Humboldt Park getting released and how many are you looking to award in Humboldt Park? I just want to be very clear with your pre-planning. So we don't, we don't have a, a time yet. It won't be in November, but uh, to Ethan's presentation, these RFPs will not be released without you, Juan, and everyone else here on this call actively participating in that process. So uh, establishing where that RFP will be released, like what, what plan will be selected and at what time frame it's really up to everyone here on the line. So, and, and Mike, uh, uh, this is this is Ted Adler. If I could just add, so you know, we're certainly um, keeping things flexible in terms of which corridors are released when. Um, but right now, we do have uh, our goal tentatively is to do Humble Park for February 2021. So, in the next round after November, essentially. Had I okay. appreciate and that response. How can we secure that Humble Park ends up on the February round? Well, you know, I, think I, I, I think that's not a bad idea because we have time then to really go out, go, go on the ground and, and reach out to our people, our business community and um, make them aware of the opportunity mm -hmm. so that we can take advantage of it. Yeah, I just I want to ensure how do we end up in that round. I'm I'm okay with February. I'm saying yeah, how, do you, how does it not move past February? February? Well, right. you know, this was always you know the Southwest investment, um, South Invest Southwest. I was not surprised that they oh, that they started on this on the far south and then the west side, and sure, because there was a lot of reaction, rightfully so, from people from our community, they included us. That's what happened politically. Yeah, and, and so, and so I, I think that's an excellent point, Alderman, because just like we modified our boundary of our corridor based on community feedback, these conversations are very useful for us to kind of say, okay, you know, Humble Park is ready. Folks on North Avenue uh, want to make sure that, that, you know, we include them for February, and so that's good for us to know that that's a priority. Yeah. And, and we can certainly work towards that. Okay. Um, and Adam, if you or your team need anything from us, like being able to get those requests in advance so that we're well equipped, I just don't wanna end up in a place where we look up, we're in the beginning of 2021 and we're still not on a schedule for RFPs, right? And there's a lot of work that we can do now to make sure that that happens. Uh, very duly noted for sure. So, um, this is, huh. Can I ask a question? Um, I, who was the presenter? What, what's your name? I'm sorry that I missed your name. Ethan. 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 Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it was basically the African American community uh, from these South and West Side communities who had basically designed the concept of those of those buildings that I saw on 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 your pictures. Um, is that the same process that we're going to use on North Avenue? I mean, I mean, I I 
I presume that in our area, I mean, what I saw in terms of building the signs, it's, you know, very modern looking, nothing ethnic. Uh, and I presume that there has got to be flexibility when it comes uh, to our to our area, right? It, um, in which if people want to be more ethnic in their the signs of the buildings that we are maybe talking about to redevelop, that that's going to be part that that's going to be incorporated into the process of the final concept of the sign. Is that correct? Or, or yeah. the city is going to impose, you know, their view of what is aesthetic and what's not. No, I, certainly the priority is everything you said. I okay. don't think there's anything you said that we disagree with. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Paul Roldan uh, with Hispanic Housing. Uh, so it, it sounds like the, the intent of the program is to uh, gin up three projects every three months uh, for a number of times. It looks like it may be nine or 12 developments in total. And uh, it looks like it includes housing resources as well from DOH. And so I'm wondering what's going to happen to the other areas in the, in the northwest side of the city that have projects that are sort of like, you know, they've been working on for, in our case, you know, two and three years. Will those, uh, you know, have to wait until this process is over for the next three or four years to be considered? Or, no. Or, um, if I could just jump in there, Ethan, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, the, the answer to that is no, they won't have to wait. And, you know, Invest Southwest is a focus on, on commercial corridors. That doesn't mean that our planning in, in other parts of the city or in other parts of this community uh, stops, right? Um, and so, you know, those projects that are in the pipeline will continue forward. The Department of Housing is coordinating with us to target some of their resources, but certainly not all. And so, you know, there, there, there would be opportunities in future run funding rounds for, uh, for other projects. Yeah, but Gerardo, if you're looking at 12 projects over the next two years, uh, and they're looking for tax credits, which is a very scarce resource, uh, there's, and I presume, you know, maybe, maybe the CHA is still building itself out. They get another half of that. There's not going to be a lot left for projects that are, you know, have been in a pipeline, at least a community pipeline for a long, long time. Uh, I'm not talking about planning, I'm talking about funding, actually, and projects, you know, getting built, you know. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. And and I think that the key here is what type of tax credit credits. So, for example, for the first three projects here, um, you know, they're, they're only using, and correct me if I'm wrong, or they're only contemplating uh, four percent tax credits, which aren't part of DOH's uh, competitive funding round. So that's what I'm saying. That is that the intent is not to, you know, uh, diminish those resources, if you will, for the projects that would happen otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Can I, Hera, look? Can I also ask you a question? Um, if this, if this round of funding, um, when it comes to our area is going to be basically for commercial development. Um, would you be using mostly uh, new market tax credits rather than the traditional um, tax credits for housing? Yeah, and, and Ethan, feel free to chime in here. Um, but one of the things that we learned from from this last round is that these um, these funding stacks are obviously, and, and most of the folks in here that do community development know. They're going to be complex. They're going to come from different um, sources, right? So it's basically yes to all of the above. What's different here in, in the way that we're trying to do this RFP um, is that we are essentially saying we're identifying based on market and feasibility analysis, right? So for each of these pretty pictures, there's actually a market analysis that's done. And we're identifying what that gap is going to be in development based on what we know about, you know, development and, and market and um, and all that good stuff. And, you know, the city is essentially saying, we'll cover that gap. And here are the different sources that we use to cover that gap. And we want the, comp <clears throat> excuse me, the, comp the competitive part of this is that we're asking developers to tell us how they would, you know, stack all those different funding sources uh, to cover 
gap, and including any other private sources that they may have. Um, okay, thank you so much. Uh, right. Last thing before we move on, before we move on to the alderman's uh, point about uh, aesthetics and design of, of these buildings, I threw in the chat box for everyone um, a link to uh, the neighborhood design guidelines uh, the DPS released uh, uh, last month. Um, and these are just so everyone can get familiar with them. Uh, but this is essentially what we're using as a set of principles in how we expect um, buildings to be designed our various uh, commercial corridors, either that, you know, that are receiving city, city funds or that have to go through a T, uh, PD process. So really taking the design excellence focus away, you know, downtown um, and bringing it down to a neighborhood scale. So, you know, highly encourage everyone to kind of get familiar with those um, so that when, when the time comes to start working towards that February deadline, um, you know, folks can, can become familiar with uh, what our thoughts are and the other thing, uh, lastly, is that we released it as a draft, meaning that we're uh, taking comments. Um, and so if there is something in there about, or, or something lacking about cultural aesthetics and cultural relevance, um, I think the Alderman's point is, is a very good one. You know, we're, we're certainly open to hearing that um, and finding ways to kind of integrate that into the design guidelines. Uh, thank you for, uh, for that point. And um, what you said, does it, does, does that in any way contradict with what Ethan responded to me in terms of being responsive to any eth ethnic or cultural desire in the in the design process? Um, oh, yeah, not at all, Alderman. I, I think what what the, we put out the design guidelines really to arm communities um, with the knowledge of of what we considered to be best practices from an urban design perspective that we haven't captured in there. And, and I'll admit that kind of led that it is this idea of, you know, cultural relevance. And so I think it's really good to hear. And it's something that will, as we finalize this for plan commission adoption, we'll have to think about how we integrate that. Um, but specifically as it relates to the work on North Avenue, no, you know, we, we want to hear that. And, and we certainly, we want the community to shape these developments. Okay, thank you. And I would hope that the Puerto Rican Cultural Center, now being the manager, uh, uh, really embrace this notion that the, the culture, cultural theme of any um, design, you know, it should be and must be very important so that we can really, um, I mean, the idea of this is to create a space that will give us some se sense of ownership ownership and belongingness uh, into some portions or spaces in the within the city of Chicago, which by and large, whenever you are in communities that are experiencing gentrification, uh, that can easily get lost uh, on the, under, under many pretenses. Uh, and so, and I, that's why I'm being so forceful, bringing this type of issues every time in this meetings because we are one of those communities. Thank you. No, I agree, Alderman, and, and we will. Um, Gerardo, though, one of my last questions because I wasn't able to ask it is how many awards and how much uh, out of the three have been awarded or are you looking to give an award for this year? How much money is being awarded this year uh, for Abram Gresham, for Englewood and Austin? Um, so the, the RFPs are still out. Their responses are due end of November. I believe it's the 24th. Um, so we don't know yet. Um, you know, we, we need to see what folks come back to us with um, in terms of their funding stack and in, in terms of the subsidies and incentives. Great. What, what's the total budget? So what's the total budget what I will, for this So what I will say um, is that on average, each of the projects uh, had a gap of around $10 million, right? Okay. Uh, which is which is what the city is saying um, that, you know, we will help fill that gap through our through our various programs and sources. Okay, great. Thank you.
All right, thanks, uh, Gerardo and Ethan, um, for um, that presentation and, and illuminating the uh, running clarity to the questions that were asked. Um, let me share what I had again. I think it'd be a good time to kind of talk about opportunity sites. Now that we've, we've kind of discussed how this process will work going forward, you know, we've taken all that we know about the community's concerns, especially around gentrification and the priorities that we're talking about, you know, that we've talked about, you know, funding projects that are already in the pipeline. Um, we talked about, um, you know, redeveloping the uh, Pioneer Bank building and some of the issues, right, that we don't have any publicly owned sites along the corridor. So we're going to have to work with the private owner in some cases to, to find a, a suitable RFP site. Uh, I think it's time to, to kind of talk through what those sites could be and where they could be. Now, this isn't going to be the definitive answer one way or the other, but I think it's just important to get the wheels turning a little bit in everyone's mind about where and how we should focus. And if there's a clear winner already, then you know maybe we can save ourselves time going into February. But uh, again, I don't want this to be that this is the, this is the last time we're going to discuss this. This is certainly not. I just want to kind of go through some sites we previously talked about and um, in the light of this new information, get some more feedback and, um, and then go from there. Hold on a second. Uh, so we identified previously uh, like four or three or four different sites along the corridor um, that could be uh, redeveloped. And if they were redeveloped, it would have a major impact on the uh, cultural, aesthetic and economic activity uh, on the corridor. Um, the first one was the 4000 West North Ave, which you all know is the, is the old Pioneer Bank building, picture that's on the left, and then the empty lot to the north on the right. Um, so I have tentatively engaged the owners of this building, at least uh, reached out to them and, and asked them uh, if they'd be willing to partner with the city development. They were somewhat open to that. Um, I think, it, you know, it'd be it, it's, the devil's in the details with that but they're at least willing to have a conversation. Um, and I know this is, or we've already discussed this, so I, I don't know that we need to add too much more here. You know, um, there are some challenges with this property. Certainly the first and second floors are gonna be hard to redevelop. And then we have a, a you know, very large building that probably needs a lot of uh, def uh, deferred maintenance to be corrected and brought up to date. That said, you know, there's, a, there's an idea and a plan for this that, that could really be impactful, I think. Certainly at the corner of Pulaski and North would make a really huge impact on the community. So uh, certainly, um, you know, a top contender for opportunity sites moving forward. But that said, I, I kind of want to discuss some of the other alternatives. Uh, can I uh, make sure, a comment about that site? Uh, mm -hmm. I know that we have <clears throat> um, brought up the issue or discussed or talked about the possibility for the first floor you know, of the, that historic building to be uh, a library and that there is support by one of the members of this group that for years has been pushing for that. But also I, I, it was brought to me last year by the Latino Film Festival that they're looking for a home to, to create like, a, you know, to, to bring the home of the Latino Film Festival, which would be obviously a, a theater um, for their annual um, festival, their annual events around the Latino Film Festival. Um, and I gave them the suggestion of that building when they come, came before the Latino Caucus, seeking for support uh, with the city to find a site for what they wanted to do, which is to, 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 to build a home. Uh, they thought that this was kind of further too far west, but given the, the, the limelight that this concept of the Invest Southwest has had, uh, there might be some rethinking and they do have some funding uh, for some kind of build up, but also build out, build out, but also, you know, with a partnership with the city and that building um, that could be another option other than the, the, um, the, the, the library because it may also, uh, well, bring additional funding to the table than just 100% from the city uh, in acquiring that building and if, or even getting into a partnership with the owners um, and also bringing the library. So that's, that's a thought. 
Um, and it will be a great cultural accent uh, uh, to the strip, um, to the corridor uh, for what we want to do. If they were to be willing to contemplate and re-engage on this idea. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, we, we can happily, I think it'd be great to have a discussion with them, even if not here, someplace else, right? I mean, there are opportunities in the neighborhood or um, other funding options for them. So um, thank you. Any other comments? Well, I, uh, this is Paul Roldan again. I continue to shamelessly, uh, you know, push our development, which is diagonally across the street from the bank, which is a senior building and, and uh, you know, it's, it, it, so it's right next to that. It's right on Pulaski, just, just south of North Avenue. And a senior project that we've been working on for quite a while now. Uh, so that, that, it seems to me, should be considered as another prospective site, given that we continue to try to get financing from HUD, from the city, uh, to make it happen. And, and, and we own the property as well, so. I appreciate that perspective. Um... Uh, Paul, and again, we, yeah, that's something that we do need to consider when we uh, considering moving forward with this. You know, there are options already on the table, and you know, if if the uh, that's a higher priority, you know, we we need to decide as a community you know, what we want to see. But I think, you know, uh, to Gerardo's point before, you know, we don't want to. This is the the RFP process shouldn't be an exclusion to uh, to other projects as well. So, ideally, we do both. Right, and how can we strategize so that they complement each other? Right. Uh, you know, would, would be an interesting conversation to have here. So whatever you do, wherever you do it, you're looking for synergy within the community. You know, you're looking to sort of light a fire, if you will. Right, right. Um, so just some other ideas uh, while we're on the subject of opportunity sites. Um, was a site at 3807 to 3811 West North, uh, my I one B in the left-hand corner is a little off, but uh, it's right to the uh, west of the, uh, the viaduct there. This is a long abandoned building. I don't know if uh, Pete is on the line. Doesn't look like it, but he had brought yes, this to I my, oh, you are. Yeah, you brought this to my attention um, as well. It's been vacant for a long time. Yeah. Real. It, it, at one time it was set for demolition, but I don't know what happened with that case. Uh, the building hit was on auction at one time. And yeah. Who is speaking, please? This is Pete from the Northwest Connection Chamber of Commerce. Oh, Pete, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Yeah, so this is, you know, you, you, I could see, you know, using the corner building and incorporating that into uh, the end development, even maybe as far as the tan color building on the right, to, you know, depending on the willingness of everyone to sell, and this would be quite a large site. Uh, it would certainly bring economic activity, you know, across to the other side of that viaduct. Um, and again, it would remove a blight on the neighborhood, but there's obviously still a lot of ownership and questions to answer there. But that, that building, it's on, it, I don't know, I'm surprised to hear that it was um, on, in demolition court because it was a foreclosure many years ago during the, during the recession. And I know it was privately acquired. And, um, and I don't, if you look at the tax roll, I don't think that is delinquent. Uh, but you know, I I think it's about eleven thousand square feet. Um, yes. the, the the building to two buildings to the west, I believe that that is empty right now. It used to be a store that used to sell um, those gifts uh, that you buy at um, carnivals. Uh, they were a carnival. Uh, companies, suppliers of those little, little uh, um, gifts, you know, that people um, do earn and win when they lose $20 and they are able to pop a, li a little <laughs> air, air bag, you know, whatever. So, and I, and they went out of business, I think. So that, so. Yeah, I mean, that, that uh, you know, may lend credence to, you know, looking at this site really hard for redevelopment, thinking, you could, you know, basically remove almost an entire block of blight from North Avenue and replace it with something that community can really uh, use and, and value. A couple more ideas. Uh, we had talked about 
both the sites on opposite sides of the northwest and northeast corner of Kimball. I understand there were some ownership issues or uh, people who didn't want to sell. But, you know, again, it's worth discussing, you know, consider these more of a gateway to the North Avenue corridor and, and closer to the, the Humboldt Park itself. So there are advantages there. Um, you know, just before I get to this, moving east along the corridor, there was a number of auto body shops, or sorry, auto dealerships that, you know, are not the highest and best land use. But um, again, I, I kind of skipped over those. So again, I, I want to bring up that if there's any uh, alternatives here, it, you know, it'd be, it'd be good to um, uh, you know, discuss them as we move forward. But just this site here at uh, 3402 to 3410 West North Avenue, this is the north well, west corner. That, uh, who took that picture? I, I found that on Street View. Yeah. yeah. Well, you should you should Google it again because yeah. there is a there is a big landscape company there. They sell they sell mulch and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. it's completely lease and uh, already in use. Okay. Yeah. They currently have a, a huge pumpkin patch. I mean, they've been active in that lot for, for, for a little bit now. I'm okay. meeting with them for the first time tomorrow via Zoom, but they are operating a business for which they don't have a zoning. They don't have the proper zoning, okay. which they discovered after they started operating. <laughs> All right, well, so then, then we're stuck with this, this even larger site um, to the east. Uh, again, uh, it looks like it used to be a used car dealership, judging by the lights. Um, it was, but it yeah. was more than two decades ago. The first yeah. three lots uh, from the northeast corner heading east, it's owned by uh, the Dunkin Donuts operator across the street. Um, they've been in conversation, they, they've been with some ideas of what they want to do something there. And then here it's owned by the remaining lots are owned by one developer um, for many, many years. So, uh, yeah, so this one might be a tough one to unlock. Uh, that said, you know, given its location um, and its size, uh, you know, it, you know, again, with the, the, I think ultimately it'll come down to like who is willing to work with the city but it'll also come down to, you know, where we want to make the biggest effort to, to get somebody to do so. So, um, you know, again, this is, this is an idea. These aren't final. Um, none of these are, uh, but I, you know, again, in discussing, uh, opportunity sites, you know, I, I want to make sure we take a look at the entire corridor and not miss any potential opportunities or any, um, uh, other sites. So it, you know, as we move forward in the next meeting or over the next month or so, you know, I would encourage everyone to kind of consider the corridor um, and, and what uh, other sites there may be or what um, information you may have about willing owners and then bring them to us and then we can start to winnow down a field and then, you know, begin to develop uh, an idea of what may or may not be feasible. Um, with that, we're kind of getting to the end of the meeting time and, uh, you know, the next steps, we, you know, onboard uh, the corridor manager and, um, and begin refining our opportunity sites and the priorities. I think we have a good idea, a vision, at least in terms of Pioneer Bank, of what we can do. And if that's something we can move forward with and that gets the consent of the community, we can go for that. Otherwise, we can find alternatives. But either way, you know, this is not the last conversation we'll have. And we hear you loud and clear that we'd like to get on the February list for RFP. So um, let's begin that work uh, to today. Our next roundtable is on the 28th, uh, but I don't want to have the last word if anyone else wants it. So uh, please feel I, free. I want to say one last comment, if I may. Uh, I want to be on record that I do support on the how, the senior development that <clears throat> that um, Paul Roland has consistently brought before us um, at these meetings. Um, and I, there's always a need for housing uh, for the seniors and to the extent that we can partner with um, HUD and they can give us the 50% project base uh, for that uh, development and use the first floor for uh, some commercial purpose, you know, like a good Puerto Rican restaurant or something like that. <laughs> we should, um, uh, we should not, <clears throat> we should not leave it off the table and be part and, and that side should be also part of the conversation. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Yeah. I, 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 to the extent that we can, I'd like to make that a reality as well. I mean, 
there's no, if we're talking about economic development of the corridor and there's economic development to be had um, immediately, right? We, we should certainly make it a priority to have that happen. Uh, yeah, like I said, I don't want to be the last voice and I appreciate everyone's comments here today. So if there's anything else, um, please let us know. And if not, um, I'll let everyone sign off a, a little bit early. Can I just quickly, hi, this is Janae DeFell with the Community Desk at the Chicago Community Trust. I actually put in the chat box, I just want to make sure for those who are doing active projects in the city right now in your neighborhood that there is pre-development funding available through the Chicago Community Trust. There is a link there. Um, uh, nonprofit agencies and community developers can apply for up to $100,000 to support pre-development work. So in case you did not get that email through your various email um, subscriptions and chains, just want to make sure everyone has saw that. It is grant funding. It is not a loan. So um, please take a look at it. Uh, where is it? I'm sorry. If I put in the link in the chat box. I'll read. I'll do it again just so that it pops up at the bottom. And I'll leave this up long enough for people to, to get that. Um. So the Chicago Community Trust. It's up to $100,000. Thank you very much. You got that, uh, Juan? I don't want to sign off for Yes, I did. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Thanks all. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Have Thank a good day. you. Have a good day. Bye. Likewise.